Cool. Um, yeah, just want to say thanks everyone for attending my talk uh, titled uh, Automating Airflow Backfills with Marquez. So we're going to go through a few use cases on when to apply backfills, when backfills make sense, and how you can use lineage metadata to um, know which downstream dependencies are affected by a data outage using Marquez. So quickly, I just want to introduce myself. Hey, I'm Willie. I'm a software engineer at Astronomer. I work on the data lineage and observability team. So we focus on um, providing tools to understand where your workflows break, uh, specifically around Airflow. Um, I'm the code creator of Marquez, which is an open source metadata service that is now part of the Linux Foundation. Um, I'm also a committer to Open Lineage, which is a standard for collecting lineage metadata for a job under execution. And if you don't mind, follow me on Twitter if you want to continue talking about uh, metadata or anything related to it. For this talk, we're going to do a few things. We're going to talk about backfills and look at it in a naive way. Um, we're also going to look into Open Lineage and do a quick introduction. Uh, we're going to do an intro to Marquez as well. And then we're going to end with backfills, so sort of a take two on it. And in this case, when we say take two, we're going to be looking at using the Lineage API that Marquez exposes to begin to traverse the Lineage graph and know which downstream dependencies were affected by maybe your job failing. And then go into, finally, yeah, go into some future work that we're working on at um, on Open Lineage where we want to extend the model and also some of the APIs that are coming for Marquez as well. Now, before we dive into that, I, you know, I just want to go into a pretty normal scenario. So before uh, Astronomer, I was actually at WeWork. Um, well, before Astronomer, I was actually at Datakin, which was a data lineage startup. So I was a founding engineer there where we, co where we developed Marquez. Um, so yeah, at WeWork, we had a pretty standard uh, approach to analyzing our room bookings. So I just want to go through a quick example on how uh, we approach room bookings and some of our analysts, some of the queries that they executed, and look into how that could be an example for our backfilling uh, scenario. So let's get booking. Uh, when, when you want to book a room at WeWork, you first look at the location and floor. And here, we're just looking at really far in the future. We want to book uh, something at Salesforce. Um, there is a time that you want to book it. So what are the open time slots? Uh, also, you want to book a duration. And then once you kind of say, OK, this room at this time uh, looks good for me. I want to come for my booking. And analysts have a really common question, or in this case, they want to know which which uh, WeWork spaces are doing well. So the question that they ask is, which locations has the most uh, room bookings? And here, since I, I'm in the Bay Area, uh, we have uh, we focus specifically on locations in, in, in San Francisco. And really what the analysts really care about is you have a set of room bookings, and they want to know the top location. And what they usually do is they write a query. In this case, it's really simple. But they usually write a query, and they give it to the data engineer and say, OK, go ahead and productionize this. And here, we just do a select on location. We get counts. We want to know what, who is booked by. And we're reading from the room bookings table, and we're group, grouping by bookings. And we're just doing a limit, uh, limit of 10. So we feel pretty good. The analyst now has a dashboard that their stakeholders can use to um, kind of predict which locations are doing well and forecast that. And as a data engineer, I feel really good. I productionized that SQL and was able to use Airflow um, and define a workflow that allowed me to run this periodically and, and make sure that I could observe if the pipeline is failing or anything or anything specific to uh, issues in the, in the work, workflow. But DAGs do fail, and backfills are a thing. So what I mean by that is, you know, let's say we, we, view, we view the execution of a workflow every month, and we have those data points. But all of a sudden, we see a sudden drop. Uh, you could ask yourself, well, is that because the data quality um, might be an issue? Is it because we, you know, we just didn't see a lot of room bookings during that time? So there's a lot of questions that you begin to ask yourself. 
And one of the ones that come up or one of the key uh, issues when you see uh, DAG failures is around data quality, so data freshness. And what I mean by that is how often is your data uh, updated? Is it updated every hour, uh, every day? And if so, is there a, miss a missing partition for that, for that time period? Um, so there's data gaps that could be a result of that. Um, there's also, with data quality, you know, there, uh, data sets, they, they change, and they change often. And what I mean by that is the shape. So columns get added and columns get dropped. Data types change. Uh, so any, any one of those scenarios could result in an issue and why your pipeline might be failing, or in this case, why our dashboards are not looking uh, correct, or at least we assume they don't. Also, bad code. I don't know about you, but I don't write bad code anymore, so I would be pretty surprised in terms of why the dad would, dad would be crashing because of bad code. So, you know, we, we iterate a lot, and specifically, we modify workflows, and we push them out regularly. Sometimes we don't, but most of the time, there are things that our analysts want us to update in the SQL, so we have to push that code out. And that might be, that might be the result of why we see this issue, but we're not sure yet. Um, but bad code, being able to understand what the reasoning behind the uh, drop in room bookings could be the result of just a recent code push. And the other one is just back, uh, DAG dependency, so upstream failures. And what I mean by that is, you know, on your edges, if, you're, if you have workflows that are doing e-tails of pulling it from S3 and loading it into your warehouse, or maybe even some external source and loading it into your platform, any of those could have failed, which results into a uh, cascading effect downstream. So before I go further, I just want to talk about backfilling and how you define that. So as your organization scales up um, and, and the amount of data and number of internal data sources also increase, uh, the amount or the type of data problems that you're equipped to deal with or want to deal with or have to deal with also uh, scales as well. Uh, so you, as, your team, as your organization grows, different teams begin to form, different sources begin to get introduced. So you could have Redshift, you could have Snowflake, Postgres. There's a lot um, of different data sources and different formats. So, and as data outages happen, they become more disruptive. Uh, so if you have a small team, if there's an outage, you're like, okay, you know, you can communicate within that small team, but imagine if you have an organization of 1,000 people and, all, and you have critical reports that need to go out every week. Um, if data outages happen, that now that communication uh, becomes a bit more difficult. You're either slacking people or you're emailing, asking people what is going on, why is there, uh, why do my dashboard don't look correct. So finally, we define backfilling. So backfilling refers to the task of retroactively processing historical data, and that just means filling in the gaps. Yeah. Um, so filling in the gaps is that you, either you could do full incremental or full processing of your data, or you just process uh, uh, a subset of it. So you can think of it, you process um, weekly. If you have weekly data, and you're missing a day, you just process, you just backfill maybe one day of that. So having a central place to analyze and understand DAG dependencies will make your organization more resilient to data outages. And that's where Marquez comes in. So Marquez is a metadata st store for lineage, job, and data set metadata. And we'll go into that in later slides. So for data outages, what usually happens if we break down the time of recovery um, or when it gets identified. 90% of the time is going to be downstream, so downstream of the issue, so that, you know, there could be a customer where, you know, they have a dashboard in their app, and now they see uh, things um, incorrect, or they see a drop in, uh, or a discrepancy from what they saw last week to what they see currently. Uh, so 90% of, of the time, that's where the issues come up, which is not a good experience. And 10% is around the code base detection. So if you're reviewing code, uh, you're able to detect, oh wait, that SQL looks wrong, or that code uh, you might want to add a test for. And that's where manual testing comes in as well. So a very small fraction becomes detected before it makes it out to the end user. Uh, one example of this is you, know, you push code out to production, then a week later 
your analyst comes to you and like and asks what is going on. My, all my all my dashboards are incorrect. So on the right on the right you see the result is days or weeks pass before incidents are detected and resolved. So then you have to ask yourself when did that bug get introduced or when did we start seeing issues in our in our data or in this case the when did the data quality drop? So Airflow does provide um, a pretty simple way to do backfills. It's, there's a backfill command, so you have a start and end date, and then you give a DAG ID, so you could run backfills at any time just using the CLI. Um, but there's an important, before I go into it a bit deeper, the execution date is kind of critical here, because uh, I got confused early on about execution dates. Um, you have to wait a period, so if you have 24 hours uh, before, or there's a 24 hour window, you want, to, you want to run your workflow every 24 hours. 24 hours have to pass before it gets triggered. Um, so I don't know, I got confused when I was initially working with Airflow and when I was uh, running backfills, so I thought it would be important to point that out. And what I'm going to do now is just kind of walk through different scenarios that happen. So you have your job and your output data set. And in this case, we have a data quality issue with our input, input data set. And you can think of a workflow that is pretty critical, so billing and payments. So if you have a, an input data set that is either missing data or might have uh, uh, duplicate rows, so you're overbilling customers, that's a pretty big issue. Uh, there are some toolings that you can use out there currently uh, to create assertions for the input data set, and that is Great Expectations. Uh, does anyone use Great Expectations or have any? Okay. Yeah. But it's one, one, one integration that we do have with Open Lineage, and uh, just talk about the different um, ways to collect assertions from your data set. So one, one way you could try to fix this is just retry it. So if your, data, if your output data set or your job is written in a way where it's idempotent, you can retry it. So it's like, oh, maybe, maybe the data is there now. But that only works for so, so much, or, or you know, that only solves the problem temporarily, especially if maybe the data wasn't complete, but now it is, uh, now it is complete. But just retrying, that has its own issues. Um, and like I mentioned, if your code is not idempotent, you're going to have duplicate rows in your output data set. So you start looking and debugging it and you're like, oh wait, there's an upstream issue. So you know, the only thing that you see as a data engineer or developer is just that input data set. That's the interface that you work with. That's the schema. Um, so you know the shape, you know where it's stored, but you don't necessarily know who owns that data set. Um, and if you had a lineage graph or be able to understand the dependencies, you could look upstream and realize, oh wait, there's a job failing, and I don't need to look into this anymore. It's not my code. It's actually something that's going on upstream. Uh, the other case is one bad data point. So one bad, um, uh, a, a, in this case, partition. So you, you know, when you read data sets, it's not just a full data set. Usually you partition it um, based off an hour or, or by the day. So a job could be failing because one partition is now missing or the, you're reading in the data and that partition has grown significantly and your job just can't process that. So your job starts failing and then the output data set is now either missing data or it's arriving in Glade. And you could imagine consumers downstream of your output data set are not now also having issues. So you have this cascading uh, problem. And for, for those of you who are still writing bad code, you're pushing code out that now results in your job failing. And even though the input data set, we know that there's nothing wrong with it, now your job um, is failing and it's the result of just some bad, bad code that you pushed out recently. And now your output data set is also delayed or there's gaps in your data. And as I mentioned before, now you have this cascading issue where anything downstream depending on your output data set is now having issues, and that could result in dashboards uh, that are critical to your organization, especially around growth or turn, um, are no longer available to your CEO, and that uh, is not a fun meeting to have. So backfilling is tough. And what I mean by that is how quickly can we detect data quality issues? 
and um, then explore them and be able to identify them and then eventually resolve them. So currently, there's not a lot of tooling out there. If you think about in terms of microservices or when you're deploying software, there's a lot of tooling and metrics that you can take a look at, and especially around downtime. So for, when you have APIs that you expose, there's so much monitoring around that. And for, uh, for jobs, the interface is really that data set. So anytime your workflow produces a data set, that becomes your interface. That's how other workflows interact with the artifact that you you output. Um, and in terms of what are learning rules should you have in place when you, when you actually identify that there's an issue, um, you know, a lot of the time, I know Uber did this and a few other or, orgs in the, uh, that I know of, um, they just run SQL and do checks on their tables uh, that run every hour. And if they realize that there's more nulls than what they expect, they'll then trigger a page of duty or their they'll pick, pick, um, a trigger a message in Slack, so that way people get notified. But that's a common way to do it. Um, but being able to notify uh, when the issue begins to happen will help you trace and debug the, issue, uh, the, the data problem a lot, a lot sooner and makes everyone's lives a lot, a lot better in, uh, in the future. Uh, so what effects, if any, would upstream DAGs have on downstream DAGs? So we, we talked about this. Um, you know, if you delay consumption, that could have cascading uh, effects on uh, dashboards. But if you're doing uh, stream processing, you know, if you have uh, a lot of data coming in and you you haven't scaled up your workers to process that streaming data, and you're no longer archiving to S3, you know that that just has issues all around. Especially if um, there are workflows that are dependent on those uh, objects in S3 being there to load into your warehouse. All right, so why are backfills this hard? They shouldn't be. And this is, when, when, why was it, when I was at Datakin, the one thing that we realized was there, there needed to be a standard. So I mentioned open lineage earlier, but there needed to be a standard on how to collect lineage metadata from your workflows to understand when your job fails, what were the run args, so what were the parameters passed into your workflow to understand which workflows are maybe uh, using a parameter and they're all failing because of that. And being able to understand the inputs and outputs, the schema of your data set, and understand when changes happen, and also version your code. Uh, so it sounds like a lot, but that, that's what the standard is attempting to do. And if we take sort of a step back and look at the current landscape, uh, you look at data analyst tools, scheduling, warehouses, SQL engines. They, if you want to pull metadata from those engines, you have to write custom code. Um, and that's what we did for Marquez, and Amundsen does the same, and a few others as well. And where OpenLage comes in, it provides that layer that allows you to say, let me get lineage metadata from a warehouse. And the, the, the spec itself allows you to look at the event and understand exactly what query was executed, by, but also by what job. So that way, we kind of crowdsource it, and we don't, we don't wor have to worry about a new release coming out for you know, Airflow and not that having um, a lot of work on our end to then resolve that for that particular version, our integration broke. Um, we now have a standard that collectively we can all contribute to and just make our lives a lot easier when it comes to processing lineage. And now I want to get into Marquez. So Marquez was a project that came out of WeWork uh, that I, I co-created. And it was, a meta, it was part of our data platform, and it collected metadata for all of our workflows, especially Airflow, and we were working on uh, streaming as well. So it's also an LFEI and data project that's incubating. And we didn't read this paper until after we started working on Marquez, but it's, um, there's a really good paper that came out of the ground, uh, came out of Berkeley called Ground, a, a data context service. So it talks about an API also uh, a model for storing metadata, but more specifically versioning. And that's what was a really interesting part. Um, so I recommend giving it a read if you want more background on just metadata and versioning. Uh, quickly here, we have uh, just a diagram of Marquez. So you have data lineage, data governance, and data discovery. Um, Marquez uh, does expose a lineage API for data governance. There's things like tagging, 
And for data, for, uh, data discovery, we have a search API that you can search your data sets and jobs. Um, so Mar Marquez is a metadata service, so it stores objects for sources, data sets, and jobs. And um, there's a core API that allows you to uh, uh, run, to do data governance. And what I mean by that is just understanding how your data flows through your platform, and also if you're tagging data sets as having PII, uh, which jobs are reading from, uh, from that data set. Uh, and for the data model, the, the job, uh, there's, there's three components, uh, or I mean there's, you know, if you look at the open lineage model, there's jobs, data sets, and runs. And I talked about the grounds paper where Marquez really comes in is around the versioning. So versioning your data set if your schema changes, but also your job version. So if your code changes, you'll be able to know um, which run was based off that, that job version and which run produced uh, a data set version, but also what was the input data set version for, uh, uh, for that run. And we have different source types that are supported, like MySQL, Postgres, Redshift, and many others. And with jobs, it's not just batch, they're streaming. And we're looking into also supporting services as well, because you have operational data stores that are pretty critical. Um, the design benefit, especially around backfilling, is just what job versions produced and consume what data set version. So you have this multi-dimensional model where you know what input data sets and the versions that they were, uh, what were the job versions, and also what were the data set versions as well. So then you'd be able to run full and incremental processing um, uh, when you want to run your backfills. So imagine if you did push that code out, and a week later you, know, you realize, oh wait, now we have issues in our dashboards, then you'd be able to go back and um, query the API and know what version or what code went out um, for, that, uh, for that particular date, and you're able to debug and see what the diff uh, between the two uh, code versions were, but also what downstream jobs were actually reading data set versions that were now corrupt and need to be reprocessed. And so Marquez is a push-based metadata collection model. So you push through a REST API, and there's open lineage events that we push to the, um, to the Marquez backend. And then we process those events and, and, and store it into our model. There's different integrations that we support. There's Airflow, Spark, DBT. Uh, we're working on Flink and Iceberg as well. But there's many other integrations that we're focusing on. And in a nutshell, when your workflow runs, especially in Airflow, you're pushing all that metadata to the Marquez backend, and Marquez begins to populate that model. So here, you have a workflow that has the Open Lineage library installed and connects to the Marquez backend and transports that metadata to the Marquez um, uh, REST API. And we're going to go over the Open Lineage and Airflow integration. Uh, just because it's really important in the context of when we do uh, the backfilling. So what we do is we collect metadata around the task lifecycle, so like the run args, the run parameters. Um, we automatically pull in the code, the link to code, as well as the inputs and outputs. So we do some SQL parsing, which the lineage uh, tracking is built in for DAGs. And um, we have actually have a new SQL parser that re we recently released that is based off Rust. So it's a lot more performant, it's more, a little bit more reliable, and uh, it's actually performing pretty well in, in production. And there's built in, the things that are built in is just that uh, link to code, so being able to know at what point did your code change, because when you push new DAGs, uh, Airflow does pull them down, and especially if, if you have them stored in Git, you'll have that Git SHA. And you don't have to do this anymore, but uh, the library is open source as part of the Open Lineage uh, repo. And you just have to modify your import. But as of recent, uh, the recent release of Airflow, which I think 2.3, um, you no longer have to modify your DAGs. It's just if you do a pip install, it will automatically begin to extract metadata from all your DAGs. And there's an operator extractor model, so I just want to show really quick here. Uh, for, you know, Airflow has a Postgres, Postgres operator, and Open Lineage has this extractor model that you can pull metadata from. So here you have on the top Airflow, and on the bottom you have Open Lineage. 
And that's where extraction happens, builds the open lineage event, and then sends it to the Marquez backend. And if we were going to parse this and walk through, first you look at the source. So you look at, in this case, we're pro processing a Postgres operator. You do SQL parsing, and that becomes your data set. And then your job, so this task ID begin, is your job. And there's just a naming convention we have with Airflow there. But those are the sequence of events that happen. And in, what we're really working towards is if you have two workflows that don't know that they depend on each other, there's an underlying implicit dependency. So you, new room bookings inserts into room bookings, and you have this top room booking stack that processes those uh, processes that table. And being able to stitch that together through a lineage graph is super important. And especially if you have different work, if you're running multiple Airflow instances and you have different DAGs running on those instances, how do you end up uh, linking them together? Um, being able to look at it in holistically through a lineage graph will help you understand the dependencies. So what I wanted to do is kind of take a ta uh, take two on querying the lineage metadata for uh, for Marquez. So here we have in step one you connect to Marquez, and the, here we're just doing a localhost 8080, and then we build a node ID, and there's a certain convention that we have for uh, the node ID in the lineage graph. So we're able to do job. Um, or data set, and then it's delimited by a colon. And analytics is the namespace, but it could be, it could be a t and you know, namespace is our way to contextualize your, na your metadata. So analytics could be a team. You could have engineering, um, but just a way to group your data. And then at the end, uh, the last uh, component is just the job name. So here we have top uh, room bookings. So if you take that node ID and you use the client and you do get lineage graph and provide that node ID, what you'll get back is all the dependencies, uh, so starting at that node, all the dependencies upstream and downstream from it. And on the bottom, it's printed out. But what, what I'm going to do is quickly go here, and I'm going to query the Marquez REST API that um, we were looking at in Python. But the REST API, if you just hit API v1 lineage and provide a node ID, what you'll get back is a graph. Um, what I didn't show. So here we have, I want to show, uh, we have a job uh, that's under food delivery example. So it's just a different example that I seeded Marquez with. But the job is called example.delivery seven days. And if we look through the graph, the graph returns back an array of nodes. So you have, a, you have the ID of the data set, um, or uh, the ID of the node. You have the type. And then you have the data blob. So, which is, so depending on if it's a job or a data set, you get different metadata back. And here we have a data set, so you get back different fields. And if I scroll down, the important thing is the in and out edges. So since Marquez keeps the dependencies between your upstream and downstream, you're able to then look at the in edges or the out edges and follow those downstream. So if we go back, and here I just printed out the lineage object. But if we go back, this is really all you need to do if you wanted to know what jobs or what Airflow DAGs you wanted to uh, rerun or run a backfill for. Uh, so if we look, we do the same thing. We connect to the Marquez client. And then we have this backfill downstream function, which is just recursive. So let's say, in this case, top room bookings is, was failing. You're able to start at that node and then follow it all the way down. So you here, we do you use the client to get the node ID. And for each out edge, so for each out edge, we'll then go ahead and see whether or not it's a job. If it's a job, that means we want to run a backfill. So the start date and end date, that could be parameterized. Here, I don't have a specific value. But if you say airflow, backfill, start date, end date, and then give the ID of the out edge, because we know it's a job, then you know that you have to uh, rerun it. And once you kind of go through that, then you just call the function again. So at the bottom, you'll see backfill downstream of node ID. And the out edge has a destination. Uh, so you just keep following it until uh, you hit the end of the graph itself. Uh, and what I wanted to show really quick, um, that API ends up feeding the Marquez UI. So here you have a complete lineage view of uh, this example that I seeded the 
uh, uh, the local instance of Marquez, but you're able to traverse and look at the different metadata for data sets. Um, you are able to, so we talked about versioning, look at the different versions that were created. If the schema changed or if it run writes to a data set, that's viewed as a different, um, different run. And then there's a, a link to the run that created that version. And we could also look at, so the, the squares are data sets, and if you look at the circle, that's a job. So here it's a job that just ran select star from, and you could look at the different run history as well. So there's a few run, runs that happen. But if any of these jobs fail, you could be able to visually look at the lineage graph and say, okay, there's a job downstream that was depending on my output data set. And rather than them reaching out to me, it's like, oh wait, my, my, my job is failing and the data set needs to be repopulated. You could automatically do it for them. So automating, automating the backfill for uh, jobs downstream uh, really removes a lot of the frictions between teams. If they're okay with that, sometimes they want full control. And uh, I'll end with, you know, just kind of failing uh, collaboratively. So being able to have a global view and understanding that teams, you don't want teams to remain isolated. So as teams run into failures, instead of failing by themselves, they should be able to learn from each other's failures and, and be able to um, depend on a lineage graph to communicate when things fail and understand the overall health of their ecosystem. Uh, or their data ecosystem. And you want to coordinate efforts. So if someone is working on an issue and let's say there's a data outage, um, someone else could be working on the same thing. And you want to combine efforts. So if someone's really good at uh, the infrastructure side and they're trying to f figure out this data quality issue, um, not being able to have a global view of how things are dependent, uh, you, might, you might be duplicating effort there. And just empowering teams. So if they if they did identify the problem through a lineage graph, and but they don't have the full tool, they don't have all the tools to solve that. Just kind of makes things, um, yeah. It's they can't resolve it, and that kind of sucks. So being empowering teams to solve these type of problems, I think it's super important. And one way to do that is being able to use the lineage graph to build on top of it, and do a lot more automation. Uh, I did write a blog on this, um, so if you wanted to kind of take a look at the script, feel free. It's, uh, it's on openlineage.io, and it's just called Backfilling with Airflow DAX using uh, Marquez. I, at the time, I didn't, there wasn't a lot of automation. I didn't think about that. So, but this goes a bit deeper and kind of covers my talk as well. And finally, with some future work, uh, there's column level lineage coming. I think it's already supported for Open Lineage, but Marquez we need to do some work to support open uh, column level lineage. Just job hierarchy and grouping, so understanding how when you return lineage metadata back, there's grouping. So if there's an Airflow DAG that has a, a, a bunch of tasks, how do we group that? So that way displaying on the UI is a lot easier. There's Flink integration that's coming and Iceberg support as well. So if you're using those uh, tools or frameworks, I'd love to talk to you after. And just want to say thank you for attending my talk. Hopefully you got something out of it, at least maybe some code to automate some of your workflows. And I wanted to end with just, you know, check out Open Lineage, follow us on Twitter, same thing with Marquez. And I'll just end with any questions. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right, thank you.